Toronto's News, tonight on News Final at 11. Wazzy Baker, Wazzy Baker, calling Toronto Island Airport. Come in, please. Wazzy Baker, Wazzy Baker, calling Toronto Island Airport. Come in, please. Well, this is bizarre. I'm not getting them, but I'm getting some kind of interference here. What is, what is this? It's supposed to be a clear bandit. 89.9. Some kind of pirate station or something. Yeah, that's what it is. Pirate station. Well, old YZ got that right. This is Pirate 90, 89.9 .9 FM, Island Radio. A hazy summer evening on Ward's Island, one of the smallest, probably the most unique neighborhood in the city. Separated by a mile long ferry ride from the rest of Toronto. This is a community with no cars, no services, no stores. Pirate Radio plays on the FM band. The Islanders continue their long battle to save their homes. And here on Ward, it's five all in the bottom of the fifth. You pal for your dog. A unique recipe with five kinds of meat in every can. Beef, chicken, heart, kidney, and liver. You'll see the quality in New Pal. Real chunks of meat in a rich, tasty jelly that dogs love. Your dog will enjoy the quality of New Pal. You can see this dog loves it. Feed your dog New Pal, made with five kinds of meat. Your dog will love it. A fumbling joker of old found the king's mood very cold. But the joker you find and three of a kind means a bonus from the new pot of gold. Edward Grand Prizes, fit for the king. You can't hide from me, joker. I'll find you. Trivia question. Where did Babe Ruth hit his first professional home run? Answer, Toronto Island. Baseball's always been big here. From 1897 to 1926, Toronto's first pro team, the Maple Leafs, played in a stadium on Hanlon's Point. On this diamond, four teams, Oso Easy, Dingbat, Otazel, and the Whitecaps have been playing every summer since the 1930s. The island most Torontonians know is center. Once a combination of residential and amusement facilities, it was sanitized in the 1960s into a children's playground and park. For many, the islands are primarily a focus for our fascination with the water. Every summer day, city kids pull pike and trout from the island lagoon. The skipper and the builder of Canada One were both islanders. So is Gary Gray, the islander's doctor, who commutes to his city-side job as a medical colonel in his 16-foot motorboat. The most celebrated Canadian of his day was a Toronto Islander. In a time when sculling held the preeminent position in the sports and gambling world that football does today, Ned Hanlon won the Canadian Championship in 1877 
the American in 78, the British in 79, and the championship of the world from 1880 to 1884. People said he learned to row before he could walk. By the time he was five, he was rowing from the point named after his family across the bay to the city. An unconventional athlete, he trained on scotch ale, stale bread, and raw steak, and worked as a bootlegger between races. He drove his competitors wild with his antics, and by the end of his illustrious career was not only Toronto's favorite son, but Canada's best-known citizen. Hanlon invested his rowing fortune into building a lavish and picturesque summer hotel on the island. It was only one of a great variety of attractions that could be found on Hanlon's and Center until they were torn down in the late 50s. This stretch of pavement and neatly manicured landscaping was then Manitou Road, known to all as the main drag. Until Metro Council decided to tear the street down, the theater and fire hall were over there, Penguin Cleaners and Miller Hardware here, the Wayside Inn, Acme Dairy, the Manitou Hotel, down by the lake, Dill's Casino and Dance Pavilion, and the Pearson House Hotel. Today, it's part of Metro Toronto Island Park, mostly grass, but somewhat of a tourist attraction, but much less of one than it was in those days when all of Toronto summered on the island. Today, people are not only using the water as a playground, but in ever-increasing numbers are living in the harbor on boats of all shapes and sizes. Steve Cameron, an islander since birth, lives with his wife Barb on a cruiser moored in an island lagoon through summer and winter. Well, usually by mid-December, the lagoons have a skin of ice on them, and it doesn't take much longer. Perhaps the first week, second week of January, we find the harbor is frozen, and then it, it all depends on how severe the weather is. This past winter, we had... Uh, over four feet or in the neighborhood of four feet of ice at the height of the winter. Uh, it doesn't bother the boats at all. We are well protected with pumps to keep the water moving. Um, they just, they run continuously through the winter. For the two years that we've been on the boat, I've survived on a half-size refrigerator, and that's no problem. The showering, we have running water all year round on the boat, so the showering's not a problem. And I'm small enough that the kitchen doesn't bother me either. The size is fine for me. Well, looks like we got another gray day today. It just takes a little bit longer during the off-peak hours of the ferry to get to the city, so it's a bit of an expedition to go in for shopping. I'll be back on the five boat in a not to get the stage. Okay, don't forget the cat food either, Steve. Okay. See you later. Bye-bye. Not all islanders, of course, live on boats. Alice Aitken has lived in a house on Algonquin Island since the 1920s. Shopping, of course, is the problem now, but people phone up and say, well, I'm sending an order, can I get anything for you? And it's great. When we first came over here, both the Eatons and Simpsons sent someone over and they'd come in and sit and take your order in the morning and it would be delivered in the afternoon, your grocery order. And of course those days are long past. And they've been replaced for most islanders by a Saturday morning ritual of taking the 7.30 ferry to the city, then walking up Church or Jarvis to the St. Lawrence Market. A hundred years ago, the ferry could have dropped them at the back door of the market but years of landfill have pushed the city forward from the original Esplanade Street over half a mile south to where it is today. Elizabeth Amer is a member of a large family that's been living on the island for generations. I like the black ones. Which are the nicest ones? The Kalamata olives are the best. These are in, uh, the both Kalamata, these are in uh, vinegar and these are in wine. Well, I think maybe one pound is all I need today. Thanks a lot. Two dollars and seventy cents, ma'am. Okay. Three ninety one, please. Try the leaves. Hi. How are you? How do you like that? Can I zip it? Lovely, my God, you know how to smell the fish those days. What do you know? 
Hey, I'm trying to sell my stuff. I gotta make my living. I got three wives. I gotta look after. <laughs> Islanders have been using the St. Lawrence market for years, but today, they and other Torontonians have a new commercial focus developing along the water's edge. Harborfront has developed into a vibrant part of the city. The weekly antique market attracts more than 10,000 people every Sunday. Bill Hawks founded the market in 1976. Every day there is something worth thousands of dollars that's bought for a few dollars. Uh, there's a number of interesting stories. Uh, a friend just ahead of me uh, uh, a few years ago came by and showed me this large diamond, uh, in fact, two diamond earrings that he'd picked up in a small uh, jewelry display case like that with uh, uh, costume jewelry for $5. And they were worth thousands of dollars. Not every item at the market is a priceless heirloom. Some, in fact, seem to be antiques for the future. Bubblegum cards chronicling MASH in Dallas will no doubt one day command as high a price tag as 15-year-old toy robots do today. Uh, I suppose one of the most important robots is Robbie Space Patrol, who's a little robot in, a little car, in his own Space Patrol car, and he, he does some actions as well. Um, Mint in the box, Robbie would sell for $2,000. Probably originally cost $29.99. He's now a, a very special collector's item. The value of preserving and enhancing the past has not been lost on the developers of Harborfront, but construction is also now underway on numerous projects that will completely transform the harbor from an industrial port to a neighborhood of housing cooperatives, parks, stores, hotels, and marinas. Part of Harborfront already is a unique school aboard a 260-foot ship moored at the foot of Spadina. The waters Ned Hanlon once practiced on are now the site of the Canadian Underwater Training Center, teaching commercial divers the basics of work in the offshore oil industry. After learning in the murky depths of Toronto Harbor, they'll spread out to Newfoundland, the North Sea, Indonesia, and South America. Are you drowning? Yeah. Well, if you get in water, that's what this thing is for. You turn that on, it gives you a back pressure in there, the water don't come in no more, use it. The training center is also the site of an intriguing new medical experiment which island doctor Gary Gray has helped to organize. Using the facilities and techniques to developed travel, at the diving one. school, he is working with diving director Jules Fortin to experiment with a possible new treatment for multiple sclerosis. They are using the school's decompression chamber, designed to save the lives of divers, to help victims of this debilitating disease. Hyperbaric oxygen has been used for many, many years for treating some types of medical problems, but it's a relatively new and still experimental treatment for multiple sclerosis. The treatments uh, uh, really were prompted by a serendipitous observation about 10 years ago uh, that a couple of patients uh, being treated for other reasons who had MS had some improvement. Uh, for people who have MS, uh, fortunately it is a treatment that does offer some small promise uh, while the risks are, are very minimal. You can yawn, you can swallow, or simply by pinching your nose and blowing you will feel your, your uh, the station tube open up. If you have any pain and you feel that you cannot equalize, right away let me know and we'll have to stop the pressure and we may have to go back up a couple of feet and as soon as we do that, usually open up. For Jeff Adams and Tracy Schmidt, another remarkable program on the waterfront allows them to learn and enjoy the skills of sailing. I'm a quadruple amputee. Uh, both my legs are above me, and my one arm is above the elbow, and then I have one finger on my other arm. Most of the sessions are like in two weeks, and we practice, learn, we learn how to sail, but we practice racing, and at the end of the, each two weeks, we have a, a competition or a race around three boys, three points, with Pier 4. Last year, we spent the whole summer, we won all the races that we had. All that means. Hey, Tracy, you can help him pull in the name when you're on that side, okay? Ready? 
Sociotech because greater fulfillment means greater productivity, and now the world is taking note. Shell Canada, putting technology and people to work. Toronto, full of great entertainment, and it's all on the TTC. We got Jones to see our symphony, art and ice, even winter's night, nice. the museum grand, dancing to a band. We've got sights to see, all on the TTC. We've got movie screens, our hockey team, castle on a hill, and Entertainment Network. Wilkinson Sword has built a good case for a knife that's always sharp. The Wilkinson Sword self-sharpening knife. It's sharp every time you need it. Because every time you remove it from the protective case, the built-in sharpener sharpens the stainless steel blade. The Wilkinson Sword self-sharpening knife. Several popular sizes. One will become your favorite knife. Case closed. From Wilkinson Sword. Rizzoli. Yeah, I was the guy that dropped everything and you were helping me. Oh my God! Yeah. Every once in a while, something special happens between two great stars. Something romantic. Are you nervous? Yeah, I am nervous. Something exciting. <laughs> something like falling in love. Just when I see you. Robert De Niro, Meryl Street. Falling in Love. Starts Wednesday at the Plaza One, Cedar Bray, and Mississauga Square One. Check local listings for details. Amongst the tranquil lagoons, politics rears its head. The Islanders' political parody recalls years of controversy and squabbling about island living. President's Committee Chairwoman Alex McLaughlin. The problem is the same problem it's always been. Metro Toronto has never let go of its vendetta to destroy our community. And now they're just trying to do it through different ways by claiming ownership of our homes uh, and evicting us that way instead of with the bulldozers, which is the way they've tried for the last 20 years. Since Metro Toronto took control in 1956, they've destroyed over 300 homes here in their attempt to turf over the island. In 1981, the Ontario government reprieved the community with a bill that ordered Metro to lease the land back through the city to the islanders. But this year, an Ontario divisional court ruled against the intent of that bill and against the islanders. Since the courts ruled that Metro owns our homes, it means that I can never regain the equity back that I've invested into my home, my life savings in my case and in most islanders' <clears throat> cases. And for most island homes, it's going to mean an investment from our own pockets of twenty to thirty thousand dollars to bring them up to city standard, and uh, that's money that we'll never be able to regain if we ever have to leave the island. And on top of that, some exorbitant rent that Metro is going to set set for for homes that they've never invested a cent. They're going to charge us rent for living in the homes that we've bought and built and maintained. On top of that, we have all the responsibilities under the bill of bringing the homes up to standard paying the taxes on the homes, the insurance, everything an owner of the home would be expected to pay for, we are responsible for. So we're carrying a double burden that no other community in Canada is asked to carry. The island community has had powerful enemies over the years, and today their enemies are as vocal as ever. John Downing of the Toronto Sun. Toronto City Council uh, uh, has allowed themselves to be conned by the Islanders. So have a few politicians at Queen's Park. 
Metro Council, remember, has always voted against the Islanders. That is, the largest body of municipal politicians in this area have consistently, and, and with, there's no vote against, they've always voted against the Islanders. The last votes of Toronto City Council are like 12-11 for the Islanders. So even with them, uh, why do they continue to exist? Uh, I don't know. Uh, plagues are hard to get rid of sometimes with the exception of a few long-time, uh, year-round residents. Uh, I think they have a right to stay. The heck with the rest of them. Get rid of them. They're nothing but squatters. We've got squatters and parks around the world. Why should we have these squatters in this park here? Whatever their legal relationship, people who have lived on the island are forever marked emotionally. Sandy and Minette Ross are former Islanders who returned to get Island Minister Dale Perkins to officially name their daughter Theodora. I would like to ask you to officiate at welcoming Thea into God's community and the world community. Silent community. Yeah, of course. What is the name of this child? Theodora Marion. Theodora Marion, I baptize you and dedicate you in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. today because yesterday they fought and won the battle to save their community, bracing themselves against eviction by Toronto's sheriff, Elizabeth Hamer. There are a group of 100 houses over there and another group of 150 houses over there, and to get to them, he has to come through this neck of land, so we decided that we would all be here and attempt to stop him at this point. We really didn't know exactly when he was coming, we knew the day, but we didn't know the hour, so we had to be prepared. And we weren't sure he'd be coming down this road, so we had watches all around the perimeter of the community to check to see exactly where he would come in. We had a CB radio system, which was both, uh, there was a central communication post where uh, the sheriff's position could be broadcast at all time and where uh, instructions to the people at the different uh, watch posts could be given. Uh, the siren was something which uh, a couple of island women located. It was a uh, used air raid siren from Britain, which we installed on the top of the clubhouse. And the purpose of that was to let everybody know the moment that the sheriff arrived. So at, uh, at 3.30, uh, we were all here waiting with a huge banner. So from way down the road, just over here, came this cortege with several sheriff's cars, several police cars, um, and uh, for some reason, an ambulance. And so we just watched them. They had their lights on too, which gave it a kind of funereal uh, feeling. So they came slowly up the road and everyone just waited very tensely, uh, not knowing quite what to expect. Although the Islanders won the Battle of Algonquin Bridge, they still do not know what to expect for themselves or their children. But for now, the islands are still a magical place to grow up in. like this is a wonderful place for children and I've always felt that when my day came that it would be the place that I'd want to raise my children to raise them in an environment that's first of all car free that's crime free that's a community of all mixed sorts of people that really do band together and help each other I mean it's, it's wonderful I feel very thankful and grateful to be here <laughs>
Will Alex McLaughlin's kids and Gary Gray's and the other children and grandchildren of this unique community still be in their family cottages a generation from now? At the moment, no one knows. The legal fight, as the islanders might say, is in extra innings. And sometimes, in the sweet, peaceable summers, there are more important things than politics.